Welcome to Class Echinoidea. This is Echina Dermata uh, Video 4 and the third class that we're going to be looking at in the Phylum Echina Dermata. And what we're looking at, of course, are uh, sea urchins and sand dollars. So we've got a few different varieties of sea urchins here. There's a semi-flattened one. Here's one that looks a bit like a limpet. Here's um, our one that looks very much like a local kinna and then a pencil urchin which is more common in the tropics but we have pencil urchins here in New Zealand as well and so let's look at the general characteristics of echinoidea this class is the sea urchin, sand dollars, heart urchins um, the ossicles that we've been looking at in the other uh, and the other classes are fused into an internal shell called a test. That's your typical um, kina test. Uh, you've all picked one up for your shell collection, most likely. And they're mostly radially symmetrical. And uh, some of these, as as are um, all of the echinoderms, uh, they have that uh, pentamerous radial symmetry. But some of them have a bilateral symmetry that's secondary, so they've evolved um, from a radially symmetrical organism, uh, which you can still see the uh, root of in the um, in all of them, to a bilateral, bilaterally symmetric organism um, that's evolved after the radial symmetry. So we'll have a look at those and it will be a little clearer, hopefully, later on in the video. Okay, the, the test, which is what the um, shell of echina is called, it has ambulacral, okay, so if you remember our ambulacral groove, those are the ones where the, um, the podia, or two feet, come out, and the interambulacral plates, the um, interambulacral areas are in between the places where the uh, plate to come out. We'll have a look at those in a sec. And they have a lot of spines, okay? And the spines are attached to the little bumps or tubercles on the surface of the test. And they have a lot of um, kind of spines. If you've ever been poked with one and had it break off in you, you'll know that they are um, have a little bit of poison and are usually going to go septic. And these are used for defense. Uh, which is fairly obvious. Okay, and they also have patisselaria, like we saw in the asteroidia. So let's have a closer look at the kina test. Okay, so here you can see the little uh, the bumps or tubercles, and you can see the outline of the ossicles. Okay, and the bigger bumps will have the bigger spines. The smaller bumps will have the smaller spines. In class, we'll have a 3D model of what uh, the spines and the um, these articulations, how they work. But they're like a ball and socket joint, just like your shoulder. Here's a little closer view. So the spines and the test itself are not actually um, connected. They're not touching. Okay through uh, uh, hard tissue. All right? They've got muscular attachments and connective tissue attachments that allow them to move, but because of that ball and socket joint, there's a little bit of a gap between the spine and the test itself, which is why when you find a kina test um, and it's sitting there and it's green when you're diving, you don't see all of the spines attached to it. It's just the, the eggshell on the inside. Okay, so, but they do have these muscles that go all over the place and um, are all around the outside of the, the spine. And so when this contracts, it'll pull the spine this direction. And when this one contracts, it'll pull, pull the spine in this direction. And in that way, they can pull the spines in any direction they like. Okay, so some of them will have a poison sac um, on the tip of the... Uh, of the spine. Okay. And here we are. Um, 
So these are some of the structures that you might find on the um, surface of a an urchin or a sand dollar. So they'll have a long spines, which are the primary spines. They'll have short spines, which are secondary spines. They have the um, uh, what do you call it? the two foot with a sucker on the end of it and um, pedicel area. Okay, all organisms are all structures that we've seen before. And if you have a close look, here's a diadema, which is very similar to the centrocephalus black purple urchin that we have here. Okay, um, but we also have diadema as well. Uh, Geezer's taken some beautiful photos of some out at Volkner Rocks. But um, our centrostephalus will have the same pattern. And if you have a chance to look at one of these through a microscope, you'll see that the uh, structure of the spine has lots of little forward sticking uh, spikes on it and lots of little grooves and or striations and points and it's sort of like palisade so it's not obviously meant to um, stab something and hold on to it it's meant for something to um, stab and not be able to slide up this this area and these things tend to break off quite easily and lodge in the attacker which is uh, very very painful Okay. The oral surface is directed to the substratum, so that, that means the mouth faces the the, um, the ground. And they have modified podia, called buccal podia, okay? So those are modified tube feet, okay, used for feeding. They have gills. Um, they have uh, plates, okay? And we'll look at those in the next picture, the genital plates, the gonad gonadocs. Uh, the mandropyrite and the periproct. Now, unfortunately, you can't see these with the naked eye generally. Um, and we'll, we'll, when you're looking at the test, because usually it's either covered in um, spines and uh, covered in epidermis, or it is uh, gone because it's not attached to the rest of it. It's not fused to the rest of the test uh, once all of that. So that uh, living tissue has, has been er eroded away. So here is your standard kina. Okay, you've seen all seen lots of those. Here is your um, t urchin test, and this is, you've all seen lots of these. Hopefully, you've collected one or two for your shell collection. And then this is what the inside looks like after you've scraped one out, if you've broken one in half, and you can see all the little suture lines. Of the ossicles. So here, this one right here is an ossicle. That's one little division, and they're actually fused together. Okay, so you can see that how the ossicles are fused together to make this this um, kind of test. And if we look at the black and white diagram here, you don't need to know all of this, uh, all of these things. But here, you can see the modified tube feet called the buccal podia. We'll see those again in sea cucumbers. You'll see the jaws of these, of what's called the Aristotle's lantern, and that's this little bit right here. I'm sure you've all seen pictures or seen those when you've cracked open a kina, if you have. Um, and um, then you can see the fused uh, ossicles here, delineated by these lines. And then if we look at the top view, that's the oral view, the aboral view, there is a central area here with these big ossicles that have the mandropyrite on top, like the asteroidians, like a starfish. The gonopores, so this is where they're, they're broadcast spawners, this is where they release all their eggs and sperm. And then this area in the middle called the periproct, which has the anus, and that's the bit that is always... It's not fused to the rest of the test, so um, this is the put that disappears from the test once it's, um, well, when you find it while you're diving, you know, the inside and the bottom, the bottom area here where the mouth is, it's just connective tissue around the outside, 
and then connective tissue here, which uh, rots away and leaves the sea egg, the kin test, with two holes in it. Okay. Uh, we have irregular urchins, and they're a little bit different. Uh, they're called heart urchins, often. Um, the test is covered with lots of small spines that almost look like they're furry. And the spines all lay in one direction so that they can move through the sand easily. Um, and they have only a very few podia, which are on the oral and aboral surface, okay, uh, but not around the entire uh, um, body of the, of the urchin. Okay, so you might see quite a few of these at um, Pilot Bay, or hard urchins, and here's an example of a very large one. Uh, I've got um, one that I will bring to class and pass around, a test, but this, you can see how all the spines lay in the um, same direction, and these things actually crawl through the substrate. They don't sit on top of it, they're, they're in muddy and sandy uh, bottoms. There are lots of them in Pilot Bay around the uh, the wharf and what you'll find is that these things here the here's the this is the, actually the um, uh, sorry the oral side here's the mouth right here and what you'll find is that these things just plow through the uh, through the sediment eating essentially any old dirt and organic particles that um, that live in that in that sediment and they digest all the organic material out and just um, the rest comes out as waste at the other end. All right. These things do have um, a one-way gut so they have a mouth, a separate mouth and anus. Um, We will look at these more closely in class. All right, uh, but don't worry too much about this slide. All right, here are some examples of what a second a um, irregular urchin looks like, and you can see that it's still got that pentamerous radial symmetry, but it's been elongated along a central axis, which makes it secondarily bilaterally symmetrical. So if you cut it down this one axis, axis, it's got the bilateral symmetry here. So this side will look just the same as this side, but that's secondary. It's still You can see the pentamerous radially symmetrical uh, origins of this species. Okay, But these things are directional when they move through the, set, the substrate, and so it's um, uh, benefited them to elongate out in this way and um, become secondarily bilaterally symmetrical. All right. The sand dollars are another type of um, um, uh, echinoid. In, they're in the class Echinoidea, so we call them an echinoid. And you'll see the structure of the sand dollars here. And, Instead of having long spines, they have these club-shaped spines right here, you can see. And they use this club-shaped spine, which you can see has a lot of um, uh, spiny sort of surface area, okay, a lot of grippy surface area uh, in order to, to move them. So they actually walk around on their spines, which is a little bit different than um, most of the uh, echinoderms, which use their tube feet for, mo uh, for movement. Okay. Here are the club-shaped spines of the um, sand dollar that they use for movement. And then you also see uh, the tube feet here. And rather than the tube feet being used for movement, they don't, they um, will essentially take mucus ball uh, mucus balls okay so they extrude mucus and it picks up the um, organic material that is um, sitting on the on or in the sediment and then these tube feet will pass it down this groove 
this food groove uh, on the oral surface of the, the sand dollar on the bottom, and they'll pass that down to the mouth. So it's a bolus of food and mucus, and it's just passed down to the mouth for ingestion. Okay, very similar to the um, Ophiuroidians or the brittle stars and basket stars. Most of the uh, kina are grazers and mostly graze on algae, but some but they kina do eat other things besides algae. They mostly eat algae. If you've um, broken one up, as divers often do, they'll break up a kina to feed the fish, and you'll see lots and lots of little tiny green balls coming out of it. Those are the little bites of algae that those th that they've taken. So that's uh, an individual little bite of the algae that these things have taken and they're digesting. Um, they do. They will eat other things besides um, algae, though, and they will uh, even our, our kina, our scavengers, on um, uh, dead uh, animal tissue. The feeding apparatus is called the Aristotle's lantern. That's the part in the middle that you've that you've seen. And uh, one of the tricks for getting kind of spines out is actually to take out the little tooth and dig. It's sharp enough, uh, but you can take the tooth out of one of these kina and dig the spine out of your skin like a splinter. So, but these things have a five-sided tooth, and if you go to this animation uh, at this URL then um, it will give you an animation of uh, how this Aristotle's lantern works. It's a um, five-sided uh, chewing apparatus, and it's the only uh, animal in the... Uh, well, it's the only... Yeah, it's the only type of animal uh, that has this apparatus. So it's unique to the, to the um, urchins. Okay, the teeth continuously grow from the end of the plates, and uh, uh, they're sort of like a like a rodent front two teeth. Okay, so if you look at the here's the Aristotle's lantern. This is your typical uh, kina. Once you break it open, you'll see this is the part that we eat, which are the eggs. All right, these gonads, and they'll extend down. But you'll notice that if we follow the digestive tract, here's the mouth and the little bits of algae are broken off here and you'll see how long this digestive tract is and that's typical of herbivores herbivores there yeah, so that's let's take that out whoops <laughs> herbivores so that's typical of herbivores um, carnivores tend to have very short digestive tracts because um, it takes a lot less time to break down the sort of protein and fat diets that we live on and uh, carbohydrates. But uh, herbivores, whether they're, they're eating plants, have to break down the cell walls of uh, the plants, and that takes a lot of time. So the herbivores tend to have long digestive tracts, and that's what you'll find with the kina when we break a, a couple open in the lab. Okay, so they're dioecious. They tend to have male and female sexes. So uh, if you're a kina eater, you'll notice that some of them are quite white row and some of them are quite yellow row. The yellow row are the, um, are the eggs and the white row are the sperm. So they have ma separate male and female sexes. And they broadcast spawn. And then the larvae develop into these things called echinopluteus larvae. These are uh, typical of actually all different echinoderms. And they will, the, one of the, the interesting thing about them is that a kinna larva will swim for several months before it finally sinks and settles to the bottom. Lots of interesting cues about how these things uh, find the reefs, but they actually listen for sound. Uh, the sound of reefs, and uh, that's a very interesting, uh, it's a, sort of a newish field in trying to figure out how larvae find the right place to settle. There'll be chemical cues, but there'll also be listening for sounds of reefs, like snappy trips and things. And here's a, uh, a, a chinopluteus. Most of them don't have spines quite this long, but if you're ever doing any um, uh, 
looking at uh, plankton toes, you'll probably find these things in the um, in your in your toe. So this is a, essentially a kina um, or an urchin larva before it settles. Okay, and they've got these long spines for defense, but also to help them uh, stop from sinking too fast. Kind of keep them up near the surface. And finally, there's an interesting um, interesting example of a uh, kinna that's adopted very well for its environment. These ones actually use a um, chemical to bore out holes in very, very rough, uh, rough reefs and then they wedge themselves into the holes and so um, they will just wait for uh, drifting algae to come along, they can catch it with their spine on their spines and with their two feet move it down to their mouth. So they are um, typical of a lot of uh, kinna, like the kinna that we have here. The ones that don't live in barrens, the ones that you see along the uh, the edge of the harbor, uh, near the near the entrance or uh, near the Maori Warrior in that area. Again, the fantastic invert dive that is the Maori warrior, they, you'll find the kinna and they'll be sitting there and just catching uh, drifting sea lettuce and you'll find some of the biggest, fattest kinna you'll ever find at the entrance just uh, catching drifting sea lettuce that uh, comes by. They never have to move. Same with the big black purple urchins that you see, well wedged into the rocks if you ever try to take one off of a wall when you're diving then um, you'll find that they are sort of wedged into a little bit of a crack, almost grown into it, and they don't actually crawl around much, uh, but they just wait for drifting kelp to come to them, catch it, and eat it. All right? And so we'll end the Echinoidea, the class Echinoidea here, and our next video is going to be Holothuroidea, or... Uh, Echinodermida number five, and that will um, be Holothuroidea, which are sea cucumbers, and the crinoids, which are um, very similar to brittle stars.